as a storyteller, she has been described by Scott Alaric, uh, who has written on performing artists and musicians of the Boston Globe. She's been described as entrancing, and that is a, an important and powerful word for Nora Dooley. Nora shares stories and does truly entrance in many places throughout in our country and other countries. In fact, uh, recently just coming from Japan. She has shared her stories in schools and churches, conferences, universities, festivals. She's the co-founder of Mass Mouth, an uh, organization for sharing stories in the Boston area. And she also works and is founder for a curriculum-based program for high school storytelling initiative. You can see information on both of these on the Mass Mouth website. Nora also is author of a number of published picture books with titles such as Everybody Cooks Rice and Bakes, Everybody Bakes Bread, Everybody Brings Noodles. And although she doesn't have any today, I'm told there are some at Wellesley Bookstore. They're published by Learner Books, and they're about her old Cambridge neighborhood. She has six spoken word CDs produced by Seed of Her Pants Productions. She is extremely busy and admits to being inspired by the world and the people in it. And she's very invested in making the world a smaller and better place through the words of all her stories, I believe. The Boston Globe once wrote about Nora that she offers a simple theme of commonality that brings people together. So this morning, I very much look forward to how Nora will be bringing us together with the words of her story and poetry. And like to invite you now to give a warm welcome as well to Nora Dooley. So I decided to do something different because this is a po there's poetry and I actually write poetry. One of my favorite quotes about writing poetry comes from The Reluctant Dragon by uh, Kenneth Graham. And there's this dragon that refuses to fight, and this little boy finds him, and he says, well, you're just useless. I mean, you play the flute, you like to smell flowers. Don't you do anything desperate? And the dragon says, well, I do write poetry. <laughs> so, so um, oftentimes sending words of good cheer and hope into the world feel kind of desperate, but I think it's a good thing to do. So this is a poem that comes from my neighborhood um, in Central Square. The books that I wrote were about my Central Square neighbors. And um, I was very lucky to get picture books published. And the, um, the neighborhood was very special, little block there, it, right outside of Central Square in Area 4. And um, my neighbors and I still share a pretty close connection. But this is a poem, and then I'll have a, a story and other things. The Necco Factory Night Shift Makes Butterscotch, Main Street, Cambridge. Buried in gum wrappers, cigarette boxes, and cups from fast meals, and rolling pocket rockets and slamming doors, and ears stuffed with damn get off me shut the mm, and hey hey what up voices, the steady throb of trains below and the growl of traffic above is pierced by sirens and night birds and lost in the deep dark that hides all hope, a breeze is heavy and sticks like a wet shirt. A breeze carries the smell of butterscotch, and it fills. The night shift is making butterscotch, and their aroma is heavy and sweet, and everywhere. The night shift is making butterscotch, the aroma is heavy and sweet, and you taste it. The night shift is making butterscotch, and the aroma is heavy and sweet. And in that same street, butterscotch soothes and smooths and moves and you slide and you float in the night shifts butterscotch. So if you've been to my part of Central Square, which is no longer my part of Central Square because I live in Coolidge Corner, Brookline. And people say, oh, well, Coolidge Corner, Brookline is really nice, too. It's so nice. And I say, yes, it is, but it's not Central Square. Um, Central Square was a pretty tough place when we were living there. And um, there would be gunshots fired. And one of my ch ch children stepped on a syringe that got stuck into the bottom of her boot as we were walking to the co-op one day. And, I mean, it was, a, it was not, it's not Cambridgeport. 
It's, also not, it's not only is it not Coolidge Corner, it's not Cambridge Port. I mean, there are parts of Cambridge that are pretty, pretty tough. But in this neighborhood, everybody really cared about one another and talked to one another. And we made a real effort to know each other's stories, and it made a real difference. Um, so there was one guy who used to walk down the street with, um, collecting cans, and he was Haitian. And I don't speak any other language but English, but I love languages and accents, and I'm so jealous of someone like you who is fluent in so many uh, languages. So I speak a little bit of French, and so I said hello to him. I said, bonjour, monsieur. And he was just so happy, because he was Haitian, that we developed a friendship. And so I wrote a book called The Can Man, and I will read it to you. So it's, to, it's meant to be a picture book, so it's two characters, a son and his mother, the can man. The can man is up early like me. I see him from my third floor window. Can man is not his name. Mama told me that. But nobody on our street calls him any name. He comes when the traffic lights blink yellow, not green and red. And sometimes the sky is purple pink. Me and the can man are the only ones awake, just us, and the crows and the pigeons and the squirrels. When it is warm, my window is open and I can hear him before I see him. Sometimes his wheels rattle and his car shakes like crazy drums. He doesn't see me, he only looks from side to side. His eyes snag empties like a hook. He catches cans and bottles like shiny fish and drop them in his rolling net. Mama says, that man knows his name. She says he knows lots of things. She says he knows the sounds of pigeons' feet clicking on empty streets. Mama, I said, you can't hear pigeons' feet. Oh, yes, says Mama. He hears that and more. He knows what the squirrels are saying about you while you sleep. Ha, I say, I don't sleep. Does he know what time the crows wake up? I do. Yes, says Mama. He knows that and more. He knows what time our cat comes home and which dogs will not bark even when he is in their garbage. He knows the schedule of the trash trucks on every street. Mama, does he know when we had a big party that we left the cans and bottles boxed just for him? Yes, he knows, says Mama. But Mama, he doesn't know about clothes because he wears all his clothes at once. He wears wool hats in the summer. Yes, says Mama, he dresses warmly so he can remember the other things he knows, the sun, the gentle breezes on his island that carry the sweet spice of flowers and oranges. Well, that's not what it smells like here on garbage day, I say. No, says Mama, it is not. Here, she says, only the can man knows why he left the rich green of the mountains and the beautiful sharp sea and the white sand to come pushing his cart in our cloudy darkness and cold. Well, does he know his full, whole, real name, I ask? Yes, says Mama. He knows his name and the names of the ones at home who call him grandfather, father, uncle, and cousin. What else, Mama, I ask, what else does he know? The can man knows which other men with carts he must avoid, for their hearts and minds are in broken pieces. Mama says the can man has all his pieces and his heart is good. But where does he sleep, Mama, I ask. Oh, the hand can man knows how to sleep with his eyes open, says Mama. He can sleep standing up. But when he has a turn to sleep in a bed, in the a tiny apartment with the other men from home, he looks at a picture, and the can man knows how a kiss on his cheek feels from each mouth that is fed with the money he sends home every week. Mama, when the can man sleeps, what does he dream? In his dream, says Mama, the can man can see in green mountains, clear sky, and bright, bright blue water, and he feels the warm sun, and everyone knows his name. So that is, um, I, I have four published pictures book, picture books, and that's one that I have been sending out and getting rejections on, and I got, um, getting picture books published is so desperate these days, makes poetry look right damn good, you know. Um, this is one that I've gotten good rejections, and a good rejection is when someone actually reads it and writes back and says, I liked it. Yeah. And I'm sending it to someone else, you know, but didn't get published. 
So um, this next story is a story about where I'm from and my family. It's a story about my brother. And I have a little introduction to it, which is a, a verse from a poem by Bob Frankie. You might know him, a, a singer-songwriter from up your way, from Marblehead, actually. For real. There's a hole in the middle of the prettiest life, so the lawyers and the prophets say. Not your father, father nor your mother, nor your lover is going to ever take it or make it go away. And there's too much darkness in an endless night to be afraid of the way we feel. Let's be kind to each other, not forever, but for real. My brother and I live in the same city. But even so, not many people who know me now have met Keith, which is not his real name. The voices do not let him go out much. The voices, the evil wizards, the voodoo, have been messing up his life for 40 years. Just recently, after banking, shopping, and stopping in a Duncan for a celebratory car for coffee near his group home, Keith said, Let's make it quick. I'm getting hit by the voodoo really bad. Now, I have never seen Keith's wizards, but I have seen their work, and I am a believer. When you have a brother who looks like Charles Manson on a bender, it's easy to believe in the power of his easy, evil wizards. You may know these wizards by their other name, their clinical name, schizophrenia. It's an awful disease. In the wake of its ongoing devastation, it has become harder and harder for me to see the human being in the shell that Keith inhabits with all those jokers. Well, this day was different. First of all, Keith called me to say he didn't want help. Well, that was weird because he only calls when he wants help. But it was lucky because I was tired and not into being that good daughter who promised her dying mother she'd take care of her brother. I'll take care of him. Don't worry. So I hung up thinking about all the things I could do with my morning instead of driving practically to Dedham and back. And the phone rang again. Just as I sat down, Keith had decided he could go out after all. The Shaw's, less than a mile from his group home, had a branch of his bank in it, and if I could wait, he would shop a bit, too. So I drove out to Dedham and picked him up around 10 a.m. He had remembered that I missed the entrance to the shopping center the last time we stopped, and it surprised me again what he knows and doesn't know. I would have driven right by it and missed it. Can you park a little closer to the store, he said as we pulled in. I feel a bit unsteady on my feet. I worry about all the meds they give him, but he was fine. Keith gets an SSI check, and most people in his situation would have the group home be the rep payee. But Keith and we have been suspicious of the bureaucracy and created convenience for autonomy. We are my younger sister and I. We are Keith's legal guardians. And between the wizards and the voodoo, the house rules, his treatment plan, the 12 medications he takes daily, there is damn little Keith controls. So we let him handle his money. Usually, Keith smells bad. Today, he didn't. That was different. Sometimes he's overcome by all the medications he takes and he falls so deeply asleep that he pees himself. On bad days, the voodoo or the wizards insist he takes dry showers. This is an invention of Keith's, which allow him to be in compliance with his hygiene plan, keep the voices happy, and not get wet. I know, I know. Mother Teresa, and I did write this before I heard that, Mother Teresa wouldn't trash talk my brother this way, but and I'm no saint. But nor am I shy or easily embarrassed, but I will admit that shopping with Keith is anxiety provoking. When we're out together, I'm always afraid that someone will be freaked out by his appearance and either ridicule him or out of fear, be openly hostile and attack. Keith has a vocal tick, which sounds like he's growling or revving an engine every two minutes or so. He growls, and then he shakes out his arm and pulls his shoulder-length hair from his face to back behind his ears. He has a very deep voice, and he lost all his teeth but rarely wears his dentures. And he talks back to the voices sometimes and converses softly but audibly. And without his glasses, he's legally blind, but he doesn't wear them anymore, so he stares and blinks and leans in to see. People are visibly shocked when they notice him. Some people like to laugh about my brother's food habits when they see him shopping. And I grant you, one person pushing a cart full of 40 pounds of cheese, three gallons of ice cream, and six bags of Doritos is curious. The thought of one person eating all of that, astounding. But I am sure no one wants to have the hole inside their life that Keith is trying to fill with all that junk or his chronic constipation. Perhaps some are a bit jealous because even with his high caloric, heart-stopping, cholesterol-laden diet, Keith is not overweight. 
But that's all it would have. What I want to tell you is what I saw that day. Keith was waiting in line to get a cashier's check to pay his rent when a woman in her early 60s rolled up and proceeded to steal the who is the craziest person in this line title right out underneath our noses. Now, even with his six foot tall frame, scary ticks, full beard, this little lady with a small shopping cart and a huge voice was giving Keith a run for his money. She did not or could not modulate her voice. She was loud and whiny and getting very agitated about the wait. The line was long and not moving. She huffed and she sighed. She stuck out her little hair covered chin and wagged it. She slapped her cart with her bank book. She complained that the line was too long. Why was the line so slow? She just needed to get her check cashed. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. She had medications to get. She just needed to get her check cashed. She needed to get her check cashed. And there was a hurricane coming. There's a hurricane coming. We gotta hurry. We gotta hurry. She just needed to get her check cashed. She just needed to, she had to stop. And people in the line shifted uneasily. They all looked away. Some in disgust, some were embarrassed for her, and some in fear. But Keith turned to her and said, don't worry, the storm is going to miss us. It's not supposed to be so bad. Well, this only ramped up her anxiety, and she started in on me after I seconded Keith's report. Well, Keith didn't notice her reaction. He had gone on to ask a teller if he could sit down and wait, and I stepped out of the line and the line of fire. Gosh, she was just not letting up. But I also needed to take a moment, because that kind gesture of Keith's had made me tear up. Given all that he struggles with, he had heard her distress and reached out to help. All the normal people were taking cover, Yet Keith had responded. It was such an Adelaide thing to do. Our mother, Adelaide, had taught us that everyone was in fact our brother and that we were all our brother's keepers. So that day was different. Deep down, struggling with the wizards and the voodoo, the essential and genuine Keith was still there. Yo, bro, it's nice to see you. Heavens, I'm making myself tear up. Stop that. So, um, let's see. I have about five minutes left. Yes. Five minutes, okay. Well, I can't promise I'll get through it in five minutes, but I'll definitely try. And I, that's kind of uh, ironic because one of my jobs in our story slams is to make sure that everybody keeps to time. Anyway, um, this is a story that comes from my childhood, and it's about uh, our family and being bullied. Our name, Dooley was always a trial. Duty, duty, duty. Oh my God, there's a duty. Oh, look at that. You know, back when I was in school, duty was a big bad cuss word, right? You know, you could, you were pretty rough and tough. You call somebody a duty. But, oh, Henry was not the worst, and he was not the biggest. He wasn't certainly even the toughest, but he was the most persistent of all the bullies that bullied my older brother, my sister, and I. He just followed us everywhere, called us, oh, duties, and he was, his house was on our way home. We had a mile walk home. Everyone else lived close to the school. We had a mile walk home, and the school bus didn't even go that far. So he would, like, throw rocks at us and names, oh, duties, ooh, what's that smell? Three duties in a row, ah, you know, it just was awful. Well, things build up, you know? Good things build up, like a beautiful dawn turns into a beautiful day, and bad things build up like bad pizza turns to sick in your stomach, you know, or a pimple turns to pus and pops. Well, being bullied built up for us, and it reached ahead on Christmas vacation. It was a beautiful, beautiful, snowy Christmas vacation. After Christmas, there had been two feet of perfect snowball, sledding snow. It was just perfect. And we were at the golf course, which was a mile away from our house, meaning two miles away from town. But there were kids from school there. And on the way to the golf course, walking through the woods, we had found the hood of an old car. And it looked just like a, a wing or something. And we realized its potential immediately and tied strings to it and carried it to the big hill at the golf course. And we turned it into a toboggan. It was like a six-person toboggan. And it looked like a wing, so we called it the bat sled. And we went, na 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 And the kids from school were playing with us. No one was calling us any names. It was great. And then O. Henry showed up. And O. Henry showed up, and he walked right up to where we're about to go down again in the sled, and he said, Everybody out of my sled got it, especially the duties. Now, my sister and I were sitting in the sled, and my brother wasn't. And I said, it's our sled, oh, Henry. He said, it's our sled, oh, Henry. Get out right now. And all the other kids got out. But my sister and I just sat there, 
And he came over and he started pushing my sister's face in the snow. Well, that's my job. I'm the older sister. He doesn't get to do that. So I started swinging and he started punching me. And my brother came over and turned him around. He said, cut out, little Henry. And Henry said, yeah, you and what army is going to make me? And my brother said, cut it out. He said, yeah, show me. And so my brother went up to him and grabbed him by his collar and by his pant legs and picked him up and turned him up and turned him poof, right down into a big pile of snow. And all you could see were his little skinny ankles flapping and his shoes and socks there in the beautiful blue sky. <laughs> and for one moment, he was completely silent. And then my brother picked him up and turned him over. And he said, OK, apologize. And he said, I don't have to make me. So my brother held him by his legs and said, apologize right now. Uh -huh, you can't make me. I am. And I'm going to do it again. My arms are getting tired. Apologize. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. So my brother turned him up and started to brush away the snow. And Henry said, leave me alone. He took off his glasses, and he just started walking. The other kids were gawking, you know, they couldn't believe this had just happened. The duties had fought back. And O'Henry just started walking, and he was just a little tiny black speck that disappeared into the black trees. And then we turned around and kept on playing. Now, you would think that this was a great resolution, but no, it was not. When we got back to school, things were worse. He got more people to gang up on us. And I always said that I, that I wanted to understand why people did stuff like that. You know, why do people do stuff like that? And only after I told this story and I saw again his legs in the sky, and I said, that was not a mistake. He didn't have boots on and two feet of snow. He had shoes on. And he had no one to walk with him back the two miles by himself, nor had he come with anyone. He had no friends. He had a family that didn't take care of him, and that's why he was a bully. And it was only after telling the story that I actually realized that. So I have one more short poem. That's my story from my childhood. Uh, and it is called The Broken Bodhisattva. And I'm sorry to say I'm not funny. Here we go. The Broken Bodhisattva. This is a poem inspired by a uh, sculpture in the Fog Art Museum. It's a bodhisattva, and the bodhisattva is in a very bodhisattva kind of pose. You know, a bodhisattva is a soul who comes back to help people, right? And it's uh, missing its hands. The hands are missing, right? I apologize for my tone. I have not been myself. The climate control is cold and penetrates. <laughs> My style, my smile is stiff as if it has been pinned on. And God knows I didn't pin this smile on. Do you see any fingers on these stumps? No. No, I don't bleed on their shiny floor. I can hear the night watchman's heartbeat. And the janitor sings in Spanish when she washes and waxes. I am a bodhisattva after all. But what I want to tell you, I have been stuck on this pedestal with a rod up my butt for a hundred years, and I will never get down. And they took my hands. What more do you need to know? Can't you see it? Must I say it? If I spoke, my polychromed lips would break, and the guardian on the next pedestal would wake, and believe me, he's best left alone and slumbering. You can see it in your eyes, can't you? I can no more save you from his madness than myself from this pedestal. His rage would thunder and break the silence in an explosion of fury where dust motes now plop, one after another, on waxed floors. Look at his fists. Look at his biceps. Don't get him started. The Persian miniatures would shake in their cases, and those Greece Grecian craters ringed with naked men following naked men would crash, sending shards into future of puzzles that are as simple as this one. What more do you need to know? Now can you see it? Or must I, a bodhisattva, say it? Help yourself. Thank you. Driving on my way to my monthly trimming, how many haircuts till I die? My body aches and my eyesight's dimming, how many haircuts till I die? Twelve years I'll have lived as long as my mother did How many haircuts till I die? Shall I keep this do or go for another lid? How many haircuts till I die? My 
my next car is gonna be my last one How many haircuts till I die? It's gonna be red and it better be a fast one How many haircuts till I die? Danny's only seven years younger How many haircuts till I die? What'll I do when he cuts no longer? How many haircuts till I die? Women, can you relate? Should have moved down by my daughter How many haircuts till I die It's warmer there and it's near the water How many haircuts till I die I'd bake cookies and I'd spell the nanny How many haircuts till I die But I'd have to leave my dear old daddy How many haircuts till I die He's fastening the cape with a too tight collar. Plenty more haircuts till I.